Hello, this is Robert Rickover. I'm an Alexander teacher in Lincoln, Nebraska. I also teach in Toronto, Canada, and mostly online these days. My guest is Penelope Easton, an Alexander Technique teacher in County Clare, Ireland. And uh, she uh, originally studied zoology at Cambridge, then trained as an Alexander teacher. And then she encountered uh, an Alexander teacher named Margaret Goldie, who was one of Alexander's early protégés, I guess you could say, uh, and studied with her for four years, which set her off on a, a lengthy journey to understand what was so different about Miss uh, Goldie, as she's known, Miss Goldie's teaching. And she's also written a book largely based on that, I believe, called The Alexander Technique, 12 Fundamentals of Integrated Movement. And information on that's available on her website, which we'll put a link to next to the interview. Uh, this is part two of our ongoing discussion of you and Miss Goldie. And we're, we're going to today answer the question which you, your, your question is, why was Miss Goldie so angry? Uh, welcome again, Penelope. Hey, Robert. Yeah. And uh, wh why was she so angry? Well, yes. I mean, everybody who went to her, or occasionally people said, oh, I didn't encounter her temper, but most people did. And it's like I've heard a lot of people say, why was she so angry? Was she just an angry person? And... Um, when I was first looking to write the book, I actually thought I'd write it more about her. And I interviewed a lot of her pupils, um, teachers and also some pupils. And they'd all encountered her, or most of them had encountered her anger. And what I began to see was she was angry that she didn't feel that the mainstream Alexander world of the, the, that had come down through the main training schools was actually true to what Alexander was doing. Now, that's a big statement. And um, I'm going to say straight off, if it wasn't for Mr. McDonald, Mr. Carrington, and Dr. Barlow, and Marjorie Barlow, we wouldn't all be here today. You know, we needed that mainstream school to, to give us a more structured process that could be taught, could be handed down, or the technique would not have survived. So let's just mm -hmm. say that straight off. I'm, I'm not looking to offend anybody here, but um, something got lost in that process. Now, have you, you read Lily Westfeld's account? I certainly you? have, yeah. Yeah, it's a fascinating account. Mm -hmm. And what she, do you remember the bit where she describes that um, in their third year, the first couple of years, Alexander was asking them to work on themselves. He gave them use of the self, he gave them their books, and said, do what I did, and tried to get them, you know, they were doing hands on back of chair, they were doing wall work, they were going up on their toes, they were, they were working on themselves. But at a certain point, and it was in the third year, McDonald said, we're not being taught how to teach. Um, we're, not, we're not learning how to take people's heads forward and up. And he's not going to tell us because what Lily Westfeld pointed out was when people asked Alexander questions, he dodged them. He wouldn't answer. Um, and he wasn't, he, they felt he wasn't teaching them how to teach. And so McDonald formed a little group that um, Lily doesn't name them. And it was Erica Whitaker who named them. John Hunter interviewed her. Mm -hmm. and, and she said, yes, it happened. And she said it was McDonald was the one who said it. And he was joined by Lulu Westfeld herself, uh, Marjorie Barlow, and, and Kitty Merrick, mm -hmm. who became Kitty Will Willapolska. And right. the four of them apparently worked together. And I also found it in, in one of Marjorie Barlow's books as well. She confirmed it, that that's indeed what happened. Mm -hmm. And they, between them, worked together and worked out what has become the training course method. And they worked out, I think McDonald, for instance, was the one who said, what's this free the neck thing? And mm -hmm. decided it meant that freeing of the atlanto-occipital joint. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yes and no, it's, it's not the whole story, it turns out. But 
you know, that's a starting point. So neck free meant that and head forward and up meant, and, and they put together the training course method that then they could, um, then they could teach on the training course. It was repeatable, the students could do it. And it's, it's, it's worked as it were. I mean, here we are, I don't know how many generations have gone past now. We must be into the fourth generation. At least, yeah, yeah. I, I lose track. Um, yeah. And you know that that method is reproducible, and and that did the technique a favour. I think you know when you have a founder, founders don't have a technique. Founders have a discovery process, like I was, and that's what I was describing in our previous podcast. That when one comes to quiet, and then lets the body respond, you make a discovery. But there isn't a technique to that, and. What then happens, and I think it's happened in more or less every method that's out there, um, mm -hmm. that somebody, the followers, some of the followers then have to turn it into a technique which is reproducible. And what Goldie pointed out was that it turned it on its head because she said, you know, in that the head, neck, back comes out of the stopping. Mm -hmm. When you when you make this stop and your body then moves, you discover that your neck frees, your head go forwards and up, your back lengthens and widens. The discovery is made and you make it anew every time. And it's a discovery process. Whereas she said the mainstream schooling has turned that on its head. And we're taught how to let the head go forward and up, back lengthen and widen and so on as the method by which we then move. So it's a technique rather than a discovery process. Does that make sense? Well, it does. But I guess my question would be, why would it not be have been possible to teach what Margaret Goldie taught you as part of a training course? And I think that is itself a very, very good question. Um, and I suspect the answer was that nobody really understood what they were doing at that point. Um, mm. I think, you know, again, if you read the accounts of all those early trainees, Peggy Williams or McDonald or Barlow or, or all of them, they all struggled to understand what was, what was happening. Um, Alexander did a phenomenal job, really, to try and understand what he discovered and put it into words. And he got halfway there. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole load of stuff that didn't get articulated. And what I've done is to um, take that the next phase. I think I was lucky in that when I went to Goldie, I was already doing Bates work. I was already very aware of the eyes. So I was aware, for instance, that when she brought me to quiet, the whole room would just come present. And I would come mm -hmm. present to the whole room and myself and the specifics of what I was looking at. She usually had tulips on the windowsill. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd, I'd be looking at the tulips and I'd be seeing that there was a, 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 a sort of basement um, space behind, a, a sort of one of those um, courtyards between buildings. Um, mm -hmm behind and I can still see that whole scene in my mind and mm. if you ask anyone who, who went to her they can tell you they can still remember all the details in her room you know the two shelves with the with the books on them and the packet of oat cakes and the, the Paddington bear and the, the desk with the clock and the old table everything was it all came present and you came present and time slowed down now what on earth is happening there yeah, you know, it's it's different, and I don't think anyone could put it in a, into words enough to reproduce it. And I, that's what I've done. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I've I've identified are the factors that were involved in that, and that's what I did when I launched the Goldie workshops. Was the this thing that she taught me coming to the mind in the brain, bringing the mind to the brain. Do you know nobody else she worked with ever heard that? And yet it's such an important right. concept. Well, I, I know that um, I've been teaching for quite a, <clears throat> quite a while now. And whenever I get a student who um, has had lessons with another teacher, uh, 
uh, I ask, one of the first questions I ask is, well, what do you do when you notice that you're not functioning as well as you'd like to? Something like that. What's your strategy for dealing with that? And what I've discovered is virtually no one has a strategy other than booking another lesson with an Alexander teacher, except for people who study with Marge Barstow, who have all kinds of useful strategies. But most students of most teachers don't really have any. I'll ask them, for example, well, does the term Alexander direction mean anything to you? Many of them will say no. Some of them will say, oh, yes, my teacher used to use that. That was something they, she used or he used. But it is not something for me to use. And in fact, my first Alexander teacher, um, who just worked with his hands exclusively, he didn't say anything much. His English wasn't very good. I once asked him about directions. And he said, Oh, no, that's for when that's for really advanced students, not for you. <laughs> and I thought, well, and I didn't know any better. And I figured maybe that was correct. And one thing Marjorie Barstow did when I first encountered her was I realized, yep, they're usable right now, and are very practical. And you can make changes in yourself quite easily if you understand them. But that does seem to be miss, have been missing and I guess still is missing from a lot of Alexander training. And I'm sure not everybody would say that. I'm sure there are people. Oh, I'm sure people would argue, would say I'm completely yes. wrong. Yes, and people well, have, you know, have said that. Yeah. Yes, it's not that you're wrong. I think it's that, that people do come out with different experiences, even out of the same school. Sure. Um, so, you know, some people did come out. I mean, there was a woman on our course, for instance, who knew she was going to go back and be the first teacher in Iceland. Mm -hmm. And I can remember as a first term trainee going up to her and saying, you know, will you work on me? And no, she said, I won't at the moment. I'm working on myself. Now, how she found out to work on herself, I have no idea. But, you know, the first term she came back after having a term back in Iceland, she was a mess. Mm -hmm. And we sort of all put her back together again. The second term she came back, she wasn't a mess. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, so what did she discover? I don't know. And I don't, I have no idea whether she went to somebody else to get what she, what she got because I never saw Misha give it to her. <laughs> but, right. but somehow she, she, she knew she had to discover it. Whereas I think for most teachers in London, you just didn't have to. Right, you know, well, and of course, Marjorie Barstow uh, left after three years of the training course. She qualified after three years and then went to study with Alexander's brother, who actually was his assistant in the States for several years. And then she was in Lincoln, Nebraska, in the middle of nowhere for many, many years. And she, as she said to me, I, there was never a day went by when I didn't explore what I learned from Mr. Alexander. I mean, it was, it was consuming for her apart from the rest of her life. And eventually she came up with a way of teaching because people asked her to do workshops and there's a whole history there. But she was really developing her ideas largely on her own after leaving England. She didn't, there were no other teachers anywhere near her. Yeah, like so she, she, had yeah she had to. Yeah. And um, Erica Whitaker, I think, had a similar experience because, you know, when they all finished the first training course, uh, most of them, you know, stayed around or built practices or whatever. Erica mm -hmm. went off traveling. I think she was straight into Papua New Guinea or somewhere remote. Right, and right. She, she told me that the others were writing to her saying, what a pity you're not using your technique, Erica. And she said to me, I didn't know what they were talking about. Of course <laughs> I was using it. I was using it every time I did the washing up and every time I you know, laid the table or whatever. She said, I was using it all the time. But you know what, there's a, there's a thread here and it goes back to the small school, I think. Do you, do you know about the link back to Irene Tasker here? Uh, no, I don't. The small school was this yeah. uh, project of uh, having a school for young children, yeah. somewhat maybe largely based on Alexander principles, right? Yeah. yeah, no, I don't know. What's the, what's the link? Right. I, okay, so Irene Tasker, she uh, was a very bright woman who 
took her first lessons, I think, in 1913 or 1917, I forget, but very early on. Mm -hmm. um, and then she also trained in Montessori. And so she persuaded Alexander to set up the small school where she was using Montessori methods, but working with the children. And right from the start, Alexander had been throwing children at her, more or less, and say, work with this child before she hardly had any lessons. Mm -hmm. And so she was having to work out right from the beginning how to help that child improve their use. And she, at that point, had no knowledge of how to put hands. So she was working in application, directing the child on how to use themselves better with no knowledge of how to use her hands. And then when she started the small school, I think by then they were putting hands on the children, but the emphasis was on how you use yourself in relationship to your reading or writing or whatever you were doing. Mm -hmm. And Goldie, the school started to expand and Goldie took her first lessons in 1927 and then in and then went away and taught in her in a mainstream school because she was also a teacher. Mm -hmm. And then when they wanted to expand the school in 1928, um, Alexander wrote to her and said, will you come back and, and be a second teacher at the school? And of course, she did it like a shot. And so again, she was working in application with the children in the school and teaching them how to keep their length and how to keep um, from being reactive in their school lessons. And both Marjorie Barlow and Erica Whitaker, as young women, in the, the year before they were allowed onto the training course, um, they were put to work in the small school as apprentices. And they both served a year of apprenticeship with Irene Tasker. Now, when the first, tra when the first training course happened, um, Goldie and Irene Tasker were both effectively trained but they would both come into the school as often as they could to discover how to work on adults because they'd never worked on adults. And Irene Tasker took to doing at-homes in the evening, uh, I think one day a week, where they would all, all, the, all Alexander's trainees would go to Irene's home and they'd all cook dinner together and they'd work in application. And Marge mm. Bosco was among those. And I heard oh. it said that she realized in later years, she got a lot from Irene Tasker and those at homes. Interesting, because <laughs> that was one of the things that really di distinguished Marjorie Barstow from most, not all, but most of the teachers I'd met in London. Marge was very application oriented. Uh, it was even a bigger difference between her and the other teachers and the fact that she was working with groups, which was also quite a difference. And I remember in the late 70s and early 80s, one of the directors of our school was Paul Collins, who was a runner, Canadian guy who was a runner, distance runner. And he started working with runners using the Alexander technique, an early kind of application approach in England it was it was quite um it's quite novel actually and and somewhat controversial mm. and uh because a lot of teachers if you were a musician and you showed up for a lesson the last thing the teacher would work with you on was playing music which the idea being well we work with you on other things and it gets carried over but a lot of times it doesn't get carried over. And um, yeah, so Paul was an early advocate of application work. And he was fascinated when I told him about Marge Barstow. But he, he had to kind of keep a low profile on that for various political and other reasons. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I remember when I was first training, there were the huge arguments going on about group work and application. Group work was a major issue, yeah, yeah. Uh, in but the late 70s. As well. But the interesting thing about that, those at homes, the one person who didn't go was mm -hmm. Patrick McDonald. Uh -huh. And, you know, I wonder if that's, I mean, I, I don't know, but I wonder if that's because he was a, you know, white middle class male, as it were, and had no interest in cooking. Or, or whether he just wasn't interested in broadening it out, I don't know. But he didn't go. And so he never got that side of it. And then 
Carrington, of course, wasn't in that first training right, course. Right, right. Um, Barlow was, and she apparently, I, I read in one of her books, her um, niece, exactly. I think, or daughter, I forget, says one day a week they would do an application day. So she mm -hmm. carried that on. But McDonald, it just wasn't present. Um, and then uh, Carrington joined in the second training course. Mm -hmm. And then they expanded and they needed the space for the training school. And that's when the school moved to Penn Hill. And so Goldie and Tasker at that point were gone. Erica mm -hmm. Whitaker had gone traveling. Marge mm -hmm. Barstow went back to America. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the people who knew that application work were gone. So Carrington oh. never got yeah, and um, certainly, so Mc, yeah, cool. right. You know, there wasn't much there. And McDon I had a number of lessons with Patrick McDonald, and it, it was, they were very standard in and out of a chair kind of things. There was no application. No, work and that you I see, I define that still further. I'd say that he only defined the technique in relationship to your own body. Mm -hmm. Which is rather how Alexander writes in his book. Mm -hmm. He doesn't write about you being in relationship to your to your tasks of life, particularly. Um, he talks mm -hmm. about in you know your parts of the body in relationship to each other, but he doesn't talk about that in relationship to life. Now, if you're going to do application work, um, and I learned this particularly from Erica Whitaker, who talked about it more explicitly, we have to be in relationship to our world, and the only person who defines that is um, Frank Pierce Jones in his book, where he actually says that in order to um, get past his faulty sensory perception, in order to be able to let himself get out of the chair without doing the old thing, he has to come into this expanded spatial relationship. So this is a whole other topic um, right, that right. we could... Well, um, I, think, um, I think we should... Um, do part three in a moment, which would be a little bit about how Alexander worked on himself and what what his initial influence, what his the influences on him was, and how that influenced his early teaching. What do you think? We just move move to that for a part. Oh, right. Three. Okay. So you're you're moving to that. Yes. Yeah, so yeah just because it's in the same line. Um, so if that's okay with you, uh, we'll um, uh, we'll bring this conversation to a close. But stay tuned. There's a, another one coming up. So my guest today uh, has been Penelope Easton, an Alexander teacher in County Clare, Ireland, and we. Uh, I'll put a link to her website by the interview. And uh, in part three coming up, we're going to talk about how Alexander came to discover the Alexander technique, you might say. So Penelope, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you, Robert. Thank you.